When we vote today, it's rightly taken for granted that women play an equal part in the process with men. It might shock us to recall that this has only been the case for less than 100 years. My great-grandmother, whom I actually met as a baby, didn't have the right to vote as a young woman. Women's suffrage was ultimately won in 1928, and the struggle is normally characterised in terms of the different tactics employed by two major groups, the suffragists and the suffragettes. But what was the real difference between them? Did one group make more of an impact than the other? And were they the only factors in gaining women the vote? I'm Luke Pierce, and this is the Radical History Channel, where we talk about the heroes, the heroines and the campaigners who fought for democratic and social freedoms through the ages. By the late 19th century, the movement for women's suffrage had been gathering momentum for decades. For over 70 years, women had been working to gain suffrage by political means. A wide range of groups lobbied the government and drove up support through letters, petitions and public meetings. And there had been some progress on women's rights. Women gained the right to divorce their husbands in 1857 thanks to the Matrimonial Causes Act. Then women gained rights over their own earnings and property in 1882 from the Married Women's Property Act. Married women even won the right to vote in local elections from the Local Government Act 1894. But women still weren't granted the right to vote in parliamentary elections. Many MPs supported women's suffrage and it was debated in Parliament almost yearly from the 1870s onwards, but a majority rejected every bill. In 1897, local societies merged into the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, the NUWSS, known as the Suffragists, led by Millicent Fawcett. The NUWSS, which boasted 50,000 members at its peak, continued the practice of peaceful lobbying and campaigning. But six years later, they weren't any closer to the vote. Emmeline Pankhurst, who'd been active in the emerging Labour Party for several years, grew frustrated with the failure to advance women's rights. In October 1903, she hosted a meeting of Labour women in her home in Manchester. Her purpose was clear from her invitation, which read, Women, we must do the work ourselves. We must have an independent women's movement. Come to my house tomorrow and we will arrange it. Pankhurst founded the Women's Social and Political Union, or WSPU, that day. The WSPU gained national attention in 1906 when Christabel Pankhurst and her friend Annie Kenny were arrested for disrupting a meeting of the Liberal Party. According to a report in the Guardian newspaper, when Liberal Party leaders refused to answer their questions about women's suffrage, Christabel and Kenny stood on their chairs and yelled and shrieked to the utmost of their ability. When policemen tried to remove them, they fought back, spitting in the face of the police superintendent. Christabel defended herself in court by saying, We cannot make any orderly protest because we have not the means whereby citizens may do such a thing. We have not a vote. And so long as we have not votes, we must be disorderly. There is no other way whereby we can put forward our claims to political justice. When we have that, you will not see us at the police courts. But so long as we have not votes, this will happen. WSPU membership multiplied overnight as women rallied to the WSPU's new motto, Deeds Not Words. They discovered a new way to avoid being sidelined and have their voices heard around the country. The term suffragette was initially a derogatory term. It was first used by the Daily Mail in 1906 and was intended as a slur. But activists in the all-female Women's Social and Political Union embraced the term. They pronounced it suffragette underlining their determination to get the vote. They even named their magazine after it. Fawcett, as leader of the NUWSS, was committed to gaining the vote through the existing legal framework. She described the work of the suffragists as being like a glacier, slow-moving but unstoppable. She sought to represent women as rational, capable and worthy of the responsibility of the vote. Pankhurst, leading the WSPU, believed women had waited long enough for a political solution from an entirely male political system. She had no interest in being seen as respectable. Rather, she wanted to demonstrate women's power. She believed women could force the government's hand by refusing to obey laws they had no say in creating. Fawcett actually wrote to the Times in 1906, expressing her support for the suffragettes. Far from injuring the movement, the suffragettes have done more during the last 12 months to bring it within the region of practical politics than we have been able to accomplish in the same number of years. Even the press spoke out in favour of the movement. 
In the same year, the Daily Mirror wrote, By what means but screaming, knocking and rioting did men themselves ever gain what they were pleased to call their rights? But by 1908, suffragettes were embracing violence and property damage. They cut telephone wires, burned down the houses of politicians, set cricket pavilions alight and carved slogans into golf courses which led to arrests. Arrested suffragettes carried on the fight in the prisons. In 1909, Marion Wallace Dunlop went on hunger strike in Holloway. Other suffragette prisoners followed Dunlop's lead. The authorities resorted either to force feeding the women or releasing those who became dangerously sick before re-arresting them once they were well. The legislation enabling this treatment became known as the Cat and Mouse Act. Rather than back down, the suffragettes leveraged this response in their favour. To undermine public support for the government, they created poster campaigns showing how brutally they were being treated. Outside the prisons, women were taking militancy to a whole new level. They slashed paintings, planted bombs and even threw a hatchet at the Secretary of State. The government was struggling to contain the suffragettes' actions. Pankhurst believed that eventually they would have no choice but to back down. Fawcett and the horrified suffragists were determined to distance themselves from the suffragettes' violence. In 1913, they organised a peaceful pilgrimage. 50,000 women marched from all over Britain to London to express both their determination to get the vote and their commitment to abide by the law. Other women chose to distance themselves still further from the movement. In 1908, Mary Humphrey Ward founded the Anti-Suffrage League, which campaigned against women being granted the vote and gathered 250,000 signatures. Things were coming to a head. Whether or not you condoned the actions of the suffragettes, the campaign for women's suffrage was very much in the national consciousness. But in 1914, all of this came to an abrupt halt. When World War I broke out and women stepped up to fill jobs at home or as medical staff on the front lines, both Fawcett and Pankhurst urged their followers to support the war effort. The NUWSS did continue to write to members of parliament requesting votes for women, but the war transformed the political landscape. About 60% of the male population had the right to vote at the time, which meant that many of the young men fighting and dying in the trenches did not. The government didn't want to deny the vote to returning war heroes, but if they made this concession to men, they had to make some sort of concession to women too. In 1918, a massive majority voted to grant suffrage to all men over 21 and to the 8 million women who were over 30 or owned property. It would be another 10 years before women like my great-grandmother were granted equal voting rights, but at last that goal was in sight. Some argue that the suffragettes actually slowed down progress towards women's suffrage by undermining the image of women as responsible. In Parliament, votes in favour of women's suffrage reduced when militancy was at its peak, but peaceful campaigning on its own had achieved little over the best part of a century. There was little to stop politicians from making empty promises and postponing female suffrage indefinitely. The suffragettes changed public perception of what women were capable of. As Professor Jane Purvis put it, that women went to prison for a cause they believed in and endured the torture of forcible feeding challenged sexist stereotypes that the female sex was feeble, irrational and uninterested in politics. Perhaps the two groups helped each other. The suffragists put forward rational arguments. The suffragettes made it impossible to ignore the issue. But the First World War also led to a change in the perception of women's capabilities and roles. The women who worked as coal miners and road layers, in munitions factories and served in France as nurses, all contributed to this change. Whether they were suffragists or suffragettes didn't matter. Ultimately, given the ultra-male dominated political landscape of the time, change had to happen in the minds of men in power. It helped that by 1918, many of the old guard MPs who'd opposed votes for women had been replaced by younger men who supported it. Following the war, MPs argued that women had shown themselves equal to men and were now worthy of the vote. There's still not something quite right about that, but perhaps we should focus on the bigger picture. Women had finally won what was rightfully theirs. If you enjoyed this video, you're probably going to enjoy this video over here about what happened before the suffragettes when ordinary people were campaigning for democracy in Britain.